Hi, my name is Ron Hood and welcome to Volume 5 of the Woods Master Series where we teach you to be the Woods Master. In this volume of the Woods Master we're going to be talking about traps and trapping. And in order to do that we've traveled up here into the high Sierra to about 10,000 feet where we could find the right kinds of materials, the right willow and the right game to make those traps effective. But before we do that, we need to take out just a couple of minutes and maybe travel over into a shady area and get out of the sun so we can talk a little bit about the ethics of trapping. In this volume of the Woods Master, we're going to be trapping real animals with real traps. If this offends you, please remember that the meat that's on your table once walked the earth much as these animals are doing today. The only real difference is when you see that meat, it's wrapped in cellophane. This is wrapped in fur, but they both started wrapped in fur. Another thing to know is that the animals we're going to be focusing on up here are called the marmot. They're also called the rock chuck in some parts of the country. Now the rock, rock chuck is a, um, well it's a rodent. It's related to the rat. In fact, that's why we like to trap them because they taste really good, just like a rat. Mm. Now, a little bit about these things. The marmot is not a particularly intelligent animal. In fact, they're just a little bit smarter than a carrot and not nearly as smart as a chicken. So if that helps you out, well, it helps you out. There's a couple other things you ought to know. Traps are kind of indiscriminate killers. You see, once you set one, you don't really know what's going to be going into it. And we're going to be taking every precaution to be sure that just the type of animal we want to trap is going to be going into that trap. But when you set them, as a matter of practice, You've got to be careful that you set them in a way that the animals you're practicing on are able to escape easily. In other words, when you make a snare, make it out of something that will break pretty easily and so the animal can get away. When it's for real, then it's a little bit different. When it's for real, you need to have a real, honest-to-God reason for setting these things up. That means that you're in a survival situation. And if you are, use them and don't hesitate. There's a couple of other things. You see, because they're so indiscriminate, you can never tell that you might, well, accidentally catch somebody's pet or maybe another camper. If you catch that pet or that camper or the animal that you're actually after, remember, if you kill it, you have to eat it. Maybe that'll help you be more discriminate when you're setting these things up. But there's a couple other cautions I'd like to offer you. Well, I want to make sure that I get all of these little uh, tips uh, to you correctly. These cautions are very, very important. And while I remember them, I may not remember all of them when I'm telling them to you. So I'm just going to read them to you. The first caution I have for you is this. Remember that some of these traps pose a potential danger of injury to the person setting them. If you got your mug too close to one of them, wang, you can catch it in the nose. Be careful. Always keep your face well clear of the moving parts. Well, that's where your nose comes in. Never allow another person to stand close to the setup of a trap. That's their nose. Never set your trap where another camper or hiker may accidentally encounter them. Well, I guess that makes sense. Always remove all parts of any trap when you're finished. Don't leave anything behind. Don't leave any, any sign that you had a trap set up. Never ever leave a trap set up when you move from an area. Always check your traps frequently. You may catch something, and then when you come back, the animal's been laying there forever and now it's just feeding maggots and you're probably not going to want to eat it. But you have to. Be careful with wild game. If they're alive in your trap, they can injure or kill you. Remember, uh, traps are indiscriminate. You might catch something like a wildcat when you're actually after a marmot. That would be a bummer. Some game may carry diseases or parasites that can make you ill. Among those things for rabbits is a disease called tularemia or rabbit fever. That can make you pretty ill. And there's a lot of other stuff, too. But be very, very careful when you're setting up traps. There are probably thousands of different types of traps we could take a look at. But for the purpose of simplicity, I've broken them down into just two basic types. One is holding, a holding type trap. And the second one is a machine type trap. Let me explain the difference between those two. A holding type type trap is like a snare. Um, could be made of wire or could be made of cord, but basically there's no moving parts. The machine type trap, on the other hand, is one that has multiple moving parts and relies on an engine that gives it power and a trigger to allow the power to express itself. And those are things like the crushing traps and the lifting traps, the figure four trap, 
the twitch up snare and those kinds of things. But basically, as I say, there are only two types of traps, the holding and the machine. So let's take a look at them. The materials we're going to be using for our machine type traps is willow. So let's cut a little bit of this stuff. Before you try to cut willow, be sure you put a little bit of a bend on it. Then you can cut the thing on the outside of the bend. Remember when you're cutting with a sharp knife to always hold whatever it is you're cutting to the side of your body. That way you won't hit yourself. Well, it isn't exactly traps and trapping, but it is hand fishing, and I, I saw this great stream here, and there's some nice fish in it, so I thought I'd show you this technique, too. One of the great things about uh, trout is, is this little bit here. They're ready to go as soon as you get them. Got some great sushi. Comes right out of a mountain stream. Can't get any fresher than this. Don't have to mess with cooking them. Don't have any diseases. Mmm. Boy. Mmm. I'm hungry. When you're thinking about doing some hand fishing, the first thing to think about is, does the stream I'm going to fish in have any alligators, crocodiles, poisonous snakes, or other things that might do me harm? If the answer is no, then you could go ahead and try this technique. Now let me show you what the basic technique involves. It's really pretty simple. You start upstream from the area that you really want to do your fishing in. Let's say that I want to fish down there somewhere. So I start reaching up underneath the bank along this area here. And as I do that, I'm going to kick up a lot of sediment. That's the stuff that I'm disturbing from the bottom. I'm also feeling up underneath the bank. Up underneath here, you're going to find a lot of little holes and cutaways where the fish like to hide during the middle of the afternoon to get out of the sun. So this is where you find them. Now, as you kick up the sediment, you might think, well, that'll scare the fish. You're right, it does. But it scares them all downstream into another one of these little pockets farther down there where I want to do my actual fishing. So I generally start about 100 feet upstream, work my way downstream. When I get to the spot, I'll reach up underneath there and find all of the fish I've scared from along the stream all clustered together in one place. As soon as you find them, you reach up underneath the bank, you can feel the fish in there, and they won't know that your hand isn't another fish. Just go, Rah! and push them down into the sand. And then, Rah! squeeze them like that. And when you do, toss them up on the side of the bank and get another one. Yeah, You can keep catching fish just that easy. This spot here is the one I was thinking about fishing. The reason I chose it was this. The stream is coming on down. It hits the edge of the bank here and then continues on downstream. But where it hits the edge of the bank, it starts to undercut it. And you can see that along the edge. It's those undercuts that are most productive for trout. The one that I'm over right here is the one that I actually chose to start fishing at. It's cut right up under here. Let me reach in there and show you. Right there, it's deeper than my arm. If I want to commit to it, I can get right in there and see if there's any fish in it. Now let me tell you something about hand fishing. Hand fishing isn't 100%. Nothing is. But it is a good chance. Once you learn the technique, you can be relatively productive at it. But one thing you've got to keep in mind is this. Never do it if it's cold and wet and windy out because it could bring on hypothermia. You're trying to stay dry and you're trying to stay warm. This will work against what it is that you're trying to do. So when you're hand fishing, be sure that you can afford to lose the heat you're going to lose to a cold mountain stream like this one here. I don't mind. It's a nice warm day. So I think I'm going to continue on with my hand fishing. The purpose of a trap is, um, well, it's to act as an energy multiplier. You see, your traps, whenever you set them up, are out there working for you. They're hunting while you're resting or doing other things that are necessary in your camp. People find it much more romantic to go out and hunt animals. But in fact, well, hunting isn't particularly effective. Traps, on the other hand, can be very effective. I know from experience that if I set my traps properly, about 25% of them 
can catch animals. Doesn't mean that they always will. But what I can do in order to make sure that I get something every night is not just set one trap or two, but set eight or ten traps. And this way I've got a darn good chance that when I get up in the morning, I'm going to have something to eat. That pile of rocks behind me is where we're going to be heading. Now I know from previous experience that there are a lot of marmots on that rock. What I want to do is I want to see what their pathways are, find out how they move. And this way I can go back to my camp and decide just exactly what kind of traps I want to put over there. And that way I'm sure to be most effective. So let's head over there and take a look at the trails. These little jewels here are marmot dung or scat. And this is a good indicator that there's marmot around. You see marmot like to sit up on top of rocks like this and bask in the sunlight. And then when it gets cold at night they go down inside holes inside of the rocks and sometimes even into the ground. But this is the place they're going to be. Now if they're going to be there that means that's probably one of the areas where you might want to set up a trap. But there's a whole lot more we got to take a look at first. Now there's a neat little marmot sitting on top of that rock. You see he likes to sit in the sun just like they do early in the morning and late in the afternoon. You can see these trails going through the grass. That's where the marmots run back and forth to get water in the morning. Sometimes the late afternoon as well. And those also are great places to set snares or other kinds of traps. This is a great trail running along here. And you can see it pops right down into this hole. Apparently some marmot uses this to get out of the way. That also is a great place to set a snare. Set one right up at the mouth of the hole or on that trail. Here's another great trail comes out of the rocks, through the brush, through the grass, and eventually it ends up at this little hole out here. Now one of the reasons all of these trails are so visible is because it's late in the afternoon. If we're here early in the morning or late in the afternoon, you can see these trails very clearly. But if it was mid-afternoon, these things might be, well, close to invisible to you. Shadows are very important whenever you're tracking or following trails. Right here in front of me, is a marmot track. These things run back and forth like this. It may not be too easy to see, but then you see the sun is right over here. If you were looking into the source of illumination, in other words, towards the sun, it would probably show a little better. And that's an important part of tracking. Whenever you want to track something, look towards the source of illumination and the track should stand out a little bit better. So we'll just move the camera over to the other side and see if you can see this trail better then. Now you can see, if you're looking towards the illumination, that the trail, which is running right along in here, stands out a whole lot better. That's because the shadows are falling on this side, and you're able to see them better. That's true, as I say, with just about any kind of tracking. Let's see where this trail goes. This trail comes right along here, follows alongside these rocks, and then back up into them there. We can put a snare right in the area between these two rocks because we know the animals running right through here. Wow! On a Jeebway bird trap. <laughs> Dinner! This is sometimes called the Ojibwe bird trap. As you can see I've got it hooked up on my walking stick. This way when I'm walking someplace, if I stop for a little while I could put the trap out and Maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe I'll catch something. Let me show you how it works. Basically, I've got a whole board through the center of the walking stick. And this could be any stick. It doesn't have to be your walking stick. Through that hole, I've got a cord passing, and that makes a little snare loop here. You can see it sticking out over the trigger. And the trigger is just a piece of wood that barely fits in the hole. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. The idea behind this trap is the bird comes down, hits the trigger. When he does, it releases the string. The string is going to be pulled by the engine, which is this large rock being attracted by the earth. That's going to tighten the loop up around his foot, as you saw earlier, and hold it. It's a pretty effective little trap and very simple. Remember, all we have to do to trigger it is to push lightly on this thing here, and down it goes. Let me show you how to put it together. The hole I bored in here is about the same size as this stick. In fact, if I try to push the stick in from the back side, it won't even go. 
but there's a little bit of a bevel on the front edge of the stick here. This is the part that goes in the hole. And if I push it in here, it just barely stays. It can almost fall out. Well, that's an important part of making this a sensitive trap. Let me show you the next part. The next part is to take the string and pass it through the hole like this. Now, if you look at the front of the string here, just right at that point, you can see there's a small knot right there. Tie a small knot in the cord, poke that little trigger stick in, and then draw the cord back and press with the stick at the same time. It's a combination of the jamming of the knot and the stick that holds this thing in place. The next thing you want to do is put some tension on it. The more tension you put on there, the tighter this is likely to get. In this case, I've got a rock just attached to the end of the snare cord. And I'll just gently let that down. Now, this is why I say be careful. If that trigger was to let go and drop the rock on the top of my foot, it could cause me some distress. Next thing after that is to take your little snare loop. And you can see I've already fashioned a small loop here pass it through like so. So I've got a little snare, nothing fancy, and lay that right over the top of the trigger stick like so. Try to spread it out a little bit. If you need to you can wet it with a little water, saliva, or anything like that to kind of get it to bend like you see here. Now remember the bird is going to come down when he lands on this his feet are going to be wrapped around the stick. That's what he's going to use to hold on. And as soon as he does that and his weight gets on there, or even if he tries to jump from it, that's when he's going to push this and it's going to catch him. Let me show you another engine. The last one used gravity. This one's going to use a stick. What I've done to this stick is I've flattened one side off. You can see here. There's also a little bevel on the top on both sides. Let me show you what I'm going to do with it. First thing we'll do is we'll take a piece of parachute cord and lay it in between the stick that I'm going to use for my engine. And I'm just going to wrap some parachute cord around it like so a few times. And bring it tight. Just pull it as tight as you can without blowing out a shoulder muscle or causing yourself some other kind of distress. Now remember that, that funny little uh, notch that I've got up at the top, rather, this little um, this little bevel right here. That's there so I can take the cord, you can see where that bevel is, and just pull like like so. When I do that, that tightens the whole affair up. Now it's on there nice and tight. I'm going to want to do another one just like that, down just a little bit farther. So we'll poke it through like so. This one doesn't need to be quite as tight. It helps if it's tight, like so. And one more around. Down below. And this time we'll draw it up like that. Now you can see I've got this stick lashed to my walking stick in a couple of places. Let me show you what this stick is all about. Now that I've lashed this pole on to my walking stick, let me show you how it works. I'll just go ahead and set the trigger first. First thing I want to do is get it in there so it'll work. Jam that thing in. Now I got this little cord. Watch this. See that pole I lashed into place is something like a bow and arrow now. This now becomes my engine for the trap. So what I'm going to want to do is make like a little loop here somewhere. And let's see, I'll make one right about in here somewhere. The somewhere stuff is always a lot of fun. Ah, let's see, I'll just put it right about here. There we go. Now, I'll bring that pole up like this. And you can see that there's a lot of pressure, a lot of tension on the string that's going to the snare. And all of it is exerted by this little snapping pole right in here. So this is the engine for this type of Ojibwe trap. Again, if the bird lands on there, that thing snaps, pulls it tight around his feet, and you got your food. Sometimes when the wind's blowing, 
the little loop will tend to blow off. So here's one way to keep it in place. Put a little saliva on it, right about where it's going to contact the trigger. Work it back and forth a little bit. And the saliva will tend to make it stick, kind of glues it in place on the trigger. Otherwise you could put a little tiny notch on the top of the trigger in a couple of places and that will also help to restrain it. But this is probably the easiest way. Before we head off to set those snares, I'm going to go ahead and make up a dozen or so. Now I'm doing it here in camp because I don't want to set, set up my snares, make the snares actually where the animals are going to be because they'll see me and it'll frighten them away. They're going to be much more cautious. Now in order to make these snares, what I'm going to do is measure off the length of the snare I want first. And I do that by just wrapping it around my arm one time like so and the snare wire is about, oh I'd say a couple of feet long. Now I could cut this wire with a knife, something like this. But if I do that, it could damage the edge. I don't want to do that to my knife. But what I do want to do is I want to cut the wire, and, and just breaking it with your hand is tough. Here's one way to do it that works pretty well. I've got two stones, and you can see I've got the wire laying against the bottom stone. Just give it a few whacks like that. That'll tend to weaken the wire, and it'll break right in half like you see there. So now I've got my two foot of snare wire. Now you probably remember that in volume three we showed you how to make a snare loop. Let me remind you how that's done. Take a dry stick about like you see here and wrap the snare wire around the loop, around the stick a couple of times. There you go, about like you see here. Once you've done that, just hold these two pieces together and spin the stick like a propeller. There we go and that wraps the, the wire around itself. There we go, that looks about right. And once you've done that, just break the stick and you're left with a nice looking little snare loop. So all we do then is pass the snare wire through it. I'm going to catch myself in this one. There we go. And we've got a snare. Simple as that. So I'm going to go ahead and make up a dozen or so and then we'll go over and put our snares in place. To keep my snares organized, I just put them on a little stick like this. That way I can kind of put that stick uh, through a belt loop and carry all these things with me. Whenever I need one, I'll just reach down and grab it and pull it off and set it. This morning when I got up, I noticed that a deer had walked right through here on a trail. When I looked a little bit closer, I discovered that this had been used quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Seems like this animal is turning this into a steady trail. Which brings me to an important point. Most of the traps we're showing you are designed for small animals. But if it's really a survival situation, why focus on small animals? It's a good idea to go after a big one. Something like this deer could feed me for a week or maybe two. It gives you skin for protection. It gives you tendons for bows and arrows and things like that. There's a lot that you can do with a larger animal. So if it's really a survival situation, try to go for the larger animals. Of course, stay away from bears and mountain lions. Let me show you how to set a trap up for a deer. The deer snare starts with some of that parachute cord you have in your survival kit. In order to do this, first thing I'll do is I'll just go ahead and tie off a little loop. Something like this. Nothing special. Just a little loop. Like that. Then we'll turn that into a prussic knot. You remember that from volume three. 
looks about like so and we'll find the end of it yeah, let's see here lots and lots of cord here da -da, da -da -da -da. there we go and I'll pass that through the prusik like this and it's basically going to be just a conventional snare now the idea of this this type of snare is not to kill the animal it would be nice if it did but the chances are it's not going to all it's really going to do is restrain it so it's going to be up to you to come up with some sort of a weapon that will be able to kill the animal so let's go ahead and put this in place I know that his head was about this high not a very big deer I'll just loop it around like so there we go that's all there is to it take the other end of the cord and tie it off to the tree like that now what we've got is a little loop that's being held out by these little branches when he comes through he'll get his head caught in here his shoulders are going to catch on this and he'll draw it tight around his neck now it's lassoed what you have to do then is come on up while he's wrapped up in this thing and kill it which means you can make some sort of a primitive spear um, a stone axe or anything else that you might have one thing you need to remember is that a deer can kill you they'll lash out with those hooves and it's all over for you so we'll talk about how you might do that at another time still in all this is an effective type trap looks like somebody took a 12 gauge shotgun into this can doesn't it but you know what it wasn't any 12 gauge shotgun what it was was a bear see here that's where the two fangs went in that's the top and here are two other fangs for the bottom just bit this thing and squeezed it together and it wasn't even a big bear just a little black bear like we've got up here locally and you know what made that hole that wasn't a shotgun that was also a bear every hole in this pan this aluminum pan was put there by bear teeth now that's not some way of telling you you've got to be careful with these big snares I don't know a better way can you imagine if you set that deer trap and caught something that could do this hmm Here's a cute little trap. Starts out with a paper cup or a plastic cup, something like this. One that appears to be dark when you put it over your eyeball. It'll look kind of dark. So it's opaque. You also need a um, little bit of Vaseline lip uh, therapy like this here, or regular Vaseline. And a third item, some bird seed. Let me show you how you put this together to make a great little quail trap. Now watch this. You take your lip therapy or whatever you happen to have that's kind of oily Put a little bit on your finger like so as soon as you've done that smear it into the cup like I'm doing here get in there and smear it around a little bit kinda give it a good little coating and yeah, squirt a little bit on the bottom there we go they seem like kind of a waste of this but when you see how this whole thing works you'll like it once you've done that you've got a, a fine layer of this grease inside take some of your seed pour it into it and shake it around pour out the excess and you can see now that the inside of the cup is pretty well coated with these little seeds that's important now what you do is you set it down where you see the quail hiking around set it on its side just about like you see here and then sprinkle a few seeds around the outside to kind of attract their attention you can put a couple inside like this and leave it be just leave it alone now what's going to happen is the quail is going to come along <laughs> chow he'll eat the stuff out here and he said whoa look in there he'll stick his head in as soon as he sticks his head in the little guard feathers on the top of his head are going to get caught on that grease when he sticks his head up like that he's going to think it's nighttime because it's dark so he'll just settle down right where he is and fall asleep so what you do is you walk outside and you see all these little paper cups sticking up in the air reach down and you got your quail pretty cool trick huh
It really works too. Now if you think that's stupid, think of this. A quail's a lot smarter than a marmot. I'm going to use this sardine can here to show you two things. One is a trap and the second is a technique. Let me show you the trap first. I'll take the sardine can, I'll turn it upside down like you see here, and then I'll take my knife and I'll just cut across it like you see here. There we go. It's good for the knife, but what the heck. It's for survival, remember. There we go. Now I've made a, as you can see, a little X in the middle of the can. The idea of this is this is your trap. If this was a foot, what would happen is the foot would hit the middle of this trap, it would punch through like so, and now you can't pull it back out. These things will bend one direction, but they won't bend easily the other direction, so it holds it pretty well. <clears throat> you can see what you got to do to get it out. In order to get it out, it would actually cut into the foot. Well, now that I've showed you how to make the trap, let me show you the technique. When I showed you that little tin can trap or how to make it, I also mentioned that there was a principle involved. Let me explain that principle to you. Right here in front of me is a little animal trail. You can see how it just kind of goes right along in this direction here. And to either side of it, you can see a bush. Now, an animal isn't going to want to go into these bushes if he can avoid it, so he'll just stay on the trail. You'll also notice that there's a stick here and another stick here. And that's the principle. These sticks are what we call timing sticks. When an animal comes walking along, and these are going to be the little <laughs> little legs, oh, looky there, there's something in my way. You'll take an extra step to step over that, that timing stick to put his foot right in the middle there. If he was coming the other direction, he'll step over, and once again, the foot goes right into the middle. That is a very important part of setting any kind of a foot snare or anything like this trap here. As the foot goes in, it sticks into the can, and looky here. There it is. There's the whole assembly. The foot's caught, little can did the catching, the can is tied up to this little stake which was driven into the ground, and the whole affair was pretty effective. Now this style of trap is a, well, it's a reasonably effective trap for catching feet. It won't hold the animal for a long time. Eventually they're going to work their way free, so it's important that you be nearby. But this thing can be made in a lot of different sizes. We used a little sardine can here, which is not particularly strong, but you could use a car door, an airplane wing, the hood of an automobile, the top of a big barrel, almost anything. This is a good trap, easy to make, and quite effective. But the most important part are those timing sticks because those are the things that make the animal put their foot in the right place at the right time. So remember that when we get into these machine type traps. Here's a little woods master tip for you. Sometimes you might find that you've got a piece of leather like this, but what you really need is some leather strips. Let me show you how to convert a piece of leather like this into those strips. Starts out with your knife. Take your knife and Put it in a piece of wood, something like this log I've got here, and then whack it with another piece of wood until it's nice and stable and won't come out easily. Once you've done that, cut a little bit off of your, your piece of leather, as you see I've done here, to give you something to get started with. And then just lay it down right on the edge of the blade, as you see here, and start pulling. And you can see that it cuts it off. Now, since you want a long strip of leather, if you start out with a round piece to begin with, or even a, an odd shaped piece, you can kind of follow it around like so and cut your strip. Once you've cut enough of this stuff, all you do is put it in some water, soak it for a little while, then when it's good and wet, hang some kind of a weight from the end of the, of the leather strips that you've cut. That'll straighten it out. Because right now, if I was to lay it down, it would, well, it kind of retake the shape of the original piece of leather that I cut it from. 
Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Nice and easy. Now I could drive a nail in just to one side of the uh, of the cutting blade to make sure that it stays the same width, but I don't have a nail, so I'm just kind of kind of eyeball it. I think I've got just about enough here. There we go. So now I needed a piece of string or a piece of leather, and look what I've got. Nice long one. Kind of handy, yeah. Remember that. The first machine type trap we're going to make is called a figure four trap. It's really a classic trap, but for some reason a lot of people have trouble making them. Now what I have here is just sort of a little model of what a figure four trap looks like. You can see it looks like the number four. And basically what we have is a diagonal piece which is going to be holding a deadfall that's some sort of a weight. Down below is this little thing here that's called the trigger. And what would happen in action is some animal will touch this trigger when he does, it'll release this diagonal piece and allow the weight to drop on the animal and kill it. Well, let me show you how to put one of these together. I'm going to use this piece of willow here to make the figure four trap. But before we begin, I want to teach you a new word. The word's enough. It's good enough, close enough, fair enough, and so forth. A lot of what we're going to do here is close enough, okay? But well, we're going to start with this thing by cutting off a couple of pieces. Actually, there's going to be three pieces. I'm going to cut this section off right here. Then I'll cut a little piece out of the middle here. And I'll leave that part for last. So we'll start with a little chopping. Now I've got to go get my pieces. We're going to start with these two pieces here. They're close enough and good enough. First, I want to take the thicker of the two and take off the end of it. And you can see they're roughly the same length. None of this is really important except for a couple of little features. One, when I'm making these things, I usually make sure that the largest piece, the, the thickest piece here, is going to be the diagonal. I do that for a reason, and you'll understand that reason in just a minute. But the first piece we start out with is going to be the vertical piece. And we're going to make this one here into the vertical piece. And you can see it's, it's fairly straight, except for one little piece on the end, which I'm going to remove. And now it's good enough. What we want to do on this is right at the very end, we're going to just cut into it a little bit like this and make a flat spot on one side, flip it right over, and make another flat spot. About like this. There we go. That's about good enough. I'll drag it down a little bit like so. And you can see it's kind of got a little little shovel look to it here. It's, it's kind of pointy. It's flat on the end. And this is going to be the bearing surface. This is where the diagonal piece is going to rest. So this is the first cut you make. Now this is going to be the diagonal. And these two pieces are going to come together something like you see right here. So the next step is going to be to cut a notch in the diagonal. The way I usually do that is I go back a couple of inches from the, from the tip and cut straight in. About like you see here. Just roll your knife a little bit. And then from the long end, cut into that. So we've got a... There we go. Excuse me while I grunt. I'm, I'm a big grunter when it comes to this kind of cutting. Grunting puts extra power into your cuts. There we go. Now, got it just about right. It's not a thing of beauty, but beauty isn't what counts here. Function. Now, I mentioned to you that I was going to tell you why I make sure that the diagonal is the heavier piece. Well, as you can see, I've already cut into the diagonal quite a ways. I've reduced the uh, the amount of strength on that diagonal piece, and that's where the rest, the weight is going to be resting. I've already reduced the, the diameter quite a bit. Now you can see these two pieces fit together about like this. The weight is eventually going to be sitting just like so. And you can see the weight will be out here. Here's your vertical piece. And then back down here, 
on the tail of the diagonal, I'm going to have to make my next cut. Now if this is resting in the notch, as it is here, my cut would be this way. It's not good enough because I've got a little funny dog leg there, which I'm going to remove. There we go. Back to work. I'll just flatten that off about like so. Flip it over and do it again. This is what's going to be encountering the actual trigger. Now you can see here's the notch that rests on the vertical piece. Here's the little flat part that's going to be touching in your trigger. This will all make a lot of sense to you in just a few minutes. Now if I could find my my part here. Now that you can see how the pieces go together, I've got the vertical piece attached to the diagonal and it all fits in this little notch down below here. The next thing I need to do is to add my trigger. Now the trigger is going to go just about like this. In order to make this good enough, the first thing I really want to do is cut the notch at the back end of the diagonal. So you can see the first cut was on the vertical, the second cut was on the top of the diagonal, the third cut will be at the bottom of the diagonal, the fourth cut is going to be at the very end of the trigger. We start that like this. Again, we're going to make a little vertical cut, like so, and then we're going to cut into it like this. This gives the back end of the diagonal piece a place to kind of catch. This will all fit in just a little bit here. That's yeah, pretty good for a starter. And remember, good enough, close enough. Fair enough. There we go. So this is going to fit about like so. Now we've got ourselves the beginnings of the figure four trap. The basic unit <coughs> at this point is done. Now we want to look for proportion and physics and so forth. I like my traps to look about like this. You can see how that is there. Now what I'm going to do is on the vertical piece here, where I didn't hear my, my fingers moving, I'm going to cut a notch on the side that faces me. I'm just going to cut a flat spot. So I'm going to mark that with my finger, like that. There's my thumb. You can see it there. That's where I want this cut to be. So I'm going to make a little notch with the blade to show me where I want the top of it. Flip it over so I don't cut towards myself. And I'm just going to shave away some of the wood. About like this. There we go. Now, I have the cut is a, on a side facing away from you at this moment. Let me show you what it looks like. There we go. Oop. Flip it around here and put the trigger in place. And you can see that I've got a little flat spot right there where I want the trigger to be. Somewhere in here. The next thing I'm going to do is to cut this a little bit flatter right here and cut a square portion on the front face of the vertical piece right here. Let me show you what I mean. You can see where that was sitting. Remember now the trigger was sitting about like this. I'm just going to shave this off a little more. Like that. Now I'm going to shave so I've got a square edge right here. Now the trigger sits on here about like so. The next thing I need to do is to make it so the trigger will work. So I assemble the various parts. I've got the trigger attached to the diagonal, which is up against it, it attached to the little, yeah, you can see how it hooks up here. Now I need to find out where exactly I want a cut to be on the trigger itself. Now if I hold these two in position like this, I can come behind on the trigger and make a little mark, like so. That little mark is right there. So I'll cut in, and again, I'll cut to that mark. Like 
like so. Now, the first time you assemble this thing, as you're actually making it, all the parts may not work immediately. You probably will have to do a little whittling to make everything come together just so. That's not a big deal. It won't take long. Let's see what we've got here now. We've got the vertical piece, we've got the diagonal piece, and we've got the trigger. And the trigger goes like so. The vertical piece goes like so. And there's your figure four trap. That's all there is to it. You see the pressure is down here, is holding all these pieces together. If I want to trigger it, all I have to do is touch the trigger, and it falls apart. Let me show you some more about that. In order to make this a little clearer, I'm going to use some of this charcoal to kind of mark the face of the side that, on the, on the vertical piece, it's facing the trigger, like so. There we are. Should make it stand out a little better for you. Now, ordinarily, what would happen is an animal would push this trigger one side or the other in order to, to trigger it. And if they hit it hard enough downward, it'll cut loose. But there's a little trick that you don't see in many books. Just underneath where the trigger hooks, I'll let the trigger go. I'm going to carve off that square corner, like so. At this point, there's only one spot where that trigger can hook, right there. Now, if the animal presses down beyond that spot, it'll just release. So if this trap is pushed this way, it releases. If it pushes that way, it comes apart. Or if it pushes down, it'll come apart. Now down is important because I don't like to put bait on these things. I use a thing that's called a treadle which is something I'm going to show you here in just a couple of minutes. But basically, that is what your figure four trap looks like. This is the basic setup of the figure four trap. The log is the deadfall. That's what's going to land on the animal and hopefully crush it. The figure four, as you can see, is down in here. You probably notice that the vertical piece on the figure four is sitting on a rock. That's because the weight of the deadfall tends to push that vertical piece down into the ground. If that happens, then when the thing falls, it may land on the vertical piece and never hit the game. So it's important that you have some sort of a surface, a strong surface there, to carry the weight of the deadfall. You might want to do the same thing at the back end of the deadfall so it will land properly. Now let's, let's test this thing out and see what it does. Here comes our game. I told you this was going to be graphic. What's this? You see? That's all there is to it. Some people have a little trouble figuring out how to set a figure four up. I mean, they could build the trap okay, but then actually getting it set underneath that deadfall is a little bit of a trick of its own. Let me show you one of the easy ways to do it. It starts out by grasping the vertical piece and the horizontal piece at the junction between the two. You can see they're already engaged like so. Just grab those two about like this. Pick up your deadfall, place the vertical piece where you want it to be, and set it someplace underneath the vertical piece about like this. Then take your trigger, put it into position, about like that, and slowly release the whole thing. And there you are. So it starts out by grasping the horizontal and the vertical, allowing the leverage and the weight and all these other things to settle down, and then just place the trigger in there. Ready? Here's a basic setup for a figure four trap. The animal lives down in this little hole here, and he has to pass between these two boulders in order to get in there. 
That means he has to pass through my trigger, or through my trap, the figure four setup right here. Now you notice here's the trigger, and what he's going to have to do is step on the trigger, push the trigger, or anything like that, in which case this rock is going to drop on his head, and he's dinner. One of the most important things about a figure four trap, or any kind of trap for that matter, is that you need to use something like these stones to focus the animal's position, to bring them into the place where your trap is set up. These stones are perfect for that. So I'm going to leave this one in place and see if he comes home and walks down his hallway. Well, it's time for us to set up some snares. But let me tell you a little something before we start. As you can see, my bird snare is already set up. This is just in case while I'm out there setting up my regular snares, I might get lucky. Something could land on here. But there's something else I want to show you. This. If I was to turn this trap upside down, like so, suddenly it changes from being a bird trap to being a mammal trap. Just because it's upside down doesn't mean it isn't going to work. You can do that with just about any trigger that I'm going to show you over the next little period. Well, with that out of the way, let's go set some snares. This is obviously a pretty busy trail, so I think I'll set my first snare right in here, right in this area. First, I've got to get these snare wires free. Obviously, the animals have to pass through this trail right here and underneath this branch. So I'm going to attach the first snare right here to this branch. How big is it going to be? Well, here's the snare here. It's about a palm in diameter, about five fingers in diameter. And I'm going to suspend it right here from underneath this branch. And then I'll anchor it off to the side to a larger branch. Now the snare is attached, it's just suspended from the branch. It's also tied off more tightly to a larger piece of wood behind there. The snare is about five fingers in diameter and a couple of fingers off the ground. And this is about all I need for marmot. Remember, this is going to direct them through here since there's a lot of brush and other stuff. This is the way their head is going to go. This snare is in the open, open ground here, right in the middle of the grass. So in order to set this one up, first thing I'm going to do is make a little stake about a foot long. And I'm going to wrap the snare wire around the stake, just like I, I did when I was making the little snare loop. Give it a couple of turns of the old propeller here. And then shove that stake into the ground at an angle away from the trail. <clears throat> there we go. Now it's in good and tight. Now we've got all of this snare wire here. And because it's wire, we can bend it, twist it, and play with it until it fits about right in the grasses. About like, about like this here. E -de -de. Sometimes you have to play with these things a little bit to get them to, to work just right. If you need it, grab a couple pieces of grass like that, and that's about right there. Now the animal will come this way or this way, stick his head in. When he does, it's going to get tight. The first thing he'll do is pull against whatever is pulling him. And as he pulls, it'll get tighter and tighter and tighter until he comes to the end of the wire. And then this will just hold him there until I get there. And that's about it. Sometimes snares are a little hard to see. In fact, most of the time, they're pretty hard to see. And it's important that they are hard to see because if they were easy, then an animal would see it and be able to avoid it. One of the things that you're going to discover is when you set up your snares, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to find them again. And that's because they're hard to see. So what I like to do is use something like a little piece of wood like this and place it next to or actually right on the side of the snare. That way when I look around, I can see just about where my snares are, especially in an open field because there's a little piece of wood sticking up. Now, if the animal trips the snare or pulls, the stick will fall over. And if the stick is missing, then you'll find an animal laying there. But at least this way here, you could go out there and check that snare. 
When you're going to snare a hole in the ground like this one here, there's a little trick to this. You see, the animal comes out of the hole this direction and travels down his trail. And when he's going back in, he travels back in the same direction. In either case, what he can't see is behind the hole. So this is where you're going to want to set up your anchor point. Once we've set up the anchor, which is going to be the stick, I'm going to show you some other tricks with snares. Now what you can see is I've actually set two snare wires into this hole. That's so the animal will get caught in one of the two. If I made one big loop that would cover the whole, the entire hole, he'd be able to crawl right through it just like he does his hole. But I've got two small loops, one on either side. But there's more to it than just that. Look at this. You can see what I've done is I've taken the, the snare wire itself and I've attached it to a piece of cord. Why do that? Well, let me explain. The snare wire is hard for an animal to bite through. So it's really important that you have wire around the animal's neck. But you may not have enough wire to go to a good solid anchor point, in which case you could tie some kind of a strong cord to it. And that's what I've done here. Not because the wire wasn't long enough, but just because I wanted to show you that sure, you could do this. While we were down there setting up our snares, this marmot here walked right into this figure four trap. Remember, this was his trail, so that's what happens. Well, this is what a marmot looks like. It's a pretty good sized animal. Remember, they taste just about the same as a rat, so they're not too bad. Most of this is just guts. There's not a lot of meat on them. There's some meat on the arms, some meat on the back here, but that's about it. There's a nice skin on it though, and it looks like this one was either blowing his coat or growing a new one. Probably blowing the old one. At any rate, we got dinner. Now, as you can see, we caught one here. How you doing, guy? But we've already got plenty of food, so what I'm going to try to do is get in here. Cut him free. I can find out where he got hooked in. You can see they, they don't want to get bit. You can see those teeth are pretty good. Come on, don't decide. Don't, don't fight me. There we go. See the snare? Get away, get away. Got it right around his neck here. There we go. I'll pull this off. So that's, that's what it's all about. Snares really do work. Now this one will recover. You can see he's, he's a little bit shook up. But uh, we'll let him go and uh, keep the dogs away from him. Let me toss that one aside. Come on now. It's okay buddy, this is our friend now. There we go. It'll take him a little while to, to get back. Come on. There he goes. As you can see while he was caught, he, he wrapped around this brush pretty good. They struggle in a snare, which is one of the problems with the things. Once they, uh, they get in there, they're caught, but um, they may not die. So machine type traps have an advantage in that they can get in there and kill the animal right away and you don't have them struggling. Fortunately for that little guy, he's not gonna be in our dinner pot tonight because we have lots to eat. This is the other snare we set alongside the trail on the little trail and you can see how it's all stretched out here. We had caught one in this one but what he did is he fought his way clear and got out. And that happens a lot with these things. So you lose a few, you win a few. I'm just going to pull the stake out of this one and there'll be no sign that we were here. That's it. Well, it looks like we caught one in here. You can see that he uh, got caught in the, the snare wire without the uh, cord on it here. I, um, see he's, just a second here. These things could bite you pretty good. It doesn't look like he's moving much. Get there. Oh no, he's gone. Cut him right around the neck. Looks like he struggled a lot. Cut himself up. That's um, that's pretty typical of these. Well, at least we got dinner now. 
that's a good sign. So one of the two snares we set up on this post was uh, was successful. We still have a few more snares to check, so let's go off and take a look at those, and later on we'll eat this one. That's good, eh? Whenever you're trapping like this, if you catch an animal, the way I like to handle it is after I after I've got the thing, I put a uh, rope around its neck, as you can see here, or its feet, doesn't make any difference, and tie it to my walking stick. The reason for that is as the animal cools off, the fleas and ticks and other things that are on it are going to jump off onto you. Unless you like to be a host to fleas and ticks, uh, it's a good idea to keep them away from your body, at least for the first few hours. Now something else. Last night when we set these snares, I set up ten snares and one machine type trap, which was the figure four. As luck would have it, the figure four trap was successful, so we caught an animal. Out of the ten snares I set up, we caught two animals. This one died in the trap, and the other one, as you saw, was still alive when we came here. So two out of ten of the snares were effective. Not too bad. But the key is you need to set a lot of snares and a lot of traps if you're going to use it. One is not going to do the job, even if you set them properly. Well, let's get back to camp, and I'm going to clean these up and cook some dinner. <laughs> A little tip for you. When you're constructing your snare loop like this, you see this little tail end of the wire sticking up? I always leave that sticking up so that it'll poke into the animal a little bit. It kind of engages the fur and makes sure that it's harder for this loop to slip off their neck. Here's another tip for keeping your snare wire organized. I just wrap it around a little piece of wood like you see here. When I need some, I just grip it like that and pull off as much as I need. That way it's not getting bundled up into these nasty little messes that are sometimes hard to straighten out. This machine type trap is a crushing trap similar to the figure four, except it only uses two sticks and they're very easy to set up. I have two sticks, one here and one here. They're resting on top of each other. The longer stick on the top, the shorter one on the bottom. To keep those two together, we have the weight of the deadfall. So the pressure of the deadfall on the top of these two sticks keeps the whole assembly in place. That is, until some animal pulls on the snare wire, which I have attached just above the union of the two sticks. When he touches that, it separates the sticks and the weight drops. It's very similar to the type of trap that's used in drowning type traps. Let's see if this little puppy works. We've got our uh, our victim here. Woo! Boy, that was close. Whoa! Look at there! What, what's in here? Ah! In the two stick deadfall I just showed you, I used a piece of snare wire to separate the two halves of the trigger. Let me show you another way to do that. That's about right. Sometimes when you're in the wilderness, you're going to need to hold something so you can saw on it. Well, you don't want to cut yourself. So you can make a primitive vise like this. I found this log with this piece broken out here and I, I just hacked away at it a little bit to make a couple of depressions. And now I have this kind of a wishbone part of a hunk of willow. What I do is this. 
push it down into the part I, I whacked out, like so. There we go. And here's the gripper portion of the little vise. Now I want to do some sawing on my, my two-stick deadfall. So I just separate these like, like that. There we go. Now that'll hold it pretty tight. Now when I start to do my sawing, it's a little safer. If my, if my saw slips off, it's going to encounter one of these two and not the top of my hand. These are the same two sticks that I used in the two stick deadfall. But in this case, instead of using snare wire, what I'm going to do is use a little stick. I've already cut two little notches in both pieces where they match up. What's going to happen is the trigger, which is now a stick, will fit in the notch like so. And then the other one, the other stick, will fit right on top of it like that. Now you can see that it, it rotates just a little bit. That's okay. This just means that it's sensitive. Now when we have this, the trigger set up, it's going to look something like this. And when an animal comes by and touches this, the two pieces separate and the deadfall falls. Here's a cool little machine type trap. It's called a drowning trap. And it works like this. I've got a snare loop tied right here to a cord. The cord is tied to a stick. Now, it probably looks like one stick, but actually it's two sticks. It's just one piece of wood that's been sawed in half and one piece is resting on top of the other. Resting on top of those two pieces of wood is a large stone. Well, this, this little cord here is tied to the stick as well as the stone. What happens is this. When an animal gets caught in the snare, he pulls on it. That makes these two sticks fall apart. The rock falls into the water, drags the animal into the water as well, where he drowns. And that's kind of handy because it kills the animal right away. Well, how do you get it back out? Also tied to the stone, is this little float, just a piece of wood tied to a cord. And this thing will be bobbing away at the top. Now, of course, you need to make sure that you got water that's deep enough to drown the animal. But it's a neat little trick. Works great on beaver, ducks, geese, or anything else that likes to visit the water. Hey, this is a duck. This is our favorite victim. Let's see if he likes our little trap. Check this out. <laughs> Whatever. Ah! 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 I'm caught! I'm caught! Ah! Ah! Oh! Oh! Guess what? He drowned. Belly up. Well, there it is. Duck dinner. Damn, a trophy. <sighs> so far we've taken a look at several different kinds of holding traps. Those are the regular snares and the foot traps. We've also taken a look at the crushing type machine traps. Those were the figure fours, the uh, two stick deadfalls, and so forth. Let's go on to another type of machine trap. These are called the twitch up type traps. These are the things that actually lift the game and set the snare more effectively and quicker. They're a dramatic looking trap. Now the first thing I want to talk about are the engines that make these things work. And I've got three of them, the three basic types set up for you. Let me show you the first of them. The first one is called a spring pole. And what I've got here is I've taken a pole, which is fairly springy, and attached it to this tree trunk. And the engine, in this case, is from this branch that's lifting, because all of these rely on lifting. This is the first one. This is the second type of engine. This is a counterbalance. What I'm using here is a heavy stone attached to a cord that goes over a branch. When the trap is triggered, the stone drops and that lifts the game. If you're lucky, perhaps the stone and the game will encounter each other on the way. The third type of engine is this branch. It's something like the spring pole, but I'm relying on a branch that was already in place to do the lifting. 
Now let me tell you a couple of tips about each one of these types of engines. First of all, let's talk about this branch. I don't know if you can tell it, but it actually kind of moves slow. If I let it go, it just takes a little while to get started. That's because the spring that's in this thing is trying to accelerate all of the material that's out on the end, all of the little pine needles and small branches that go beyond the point where my cord is attached. In order to make this thing work fast and effectively, we need to remove all of the extra material that that spring action is trying to accelerate. Everything has to come off. This is one of the reasons I don't particularly like this style of engine. You see, I'm going to have to do damage to the wilderness in order to get it to work. Oh sure, in an emergency I wouldn't mind doing that. But ordinarily, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be chopping away at trees just to get a little spring pole action because there's a better way. A little tip about the counterweight technique. There's some real advantages to this, but the first thing you need to consider is how are you going to speed up the action of this cord over whatever it is that's acting as a bearing surface. In this case, it's a branch above my head. Well, one thing you can do is to work the cord back and forth a few times like so. That helps smooth the path over the top of the branch, and it won't damage the branch in any appreciable way. Now, one other advantage of this type of trap is this. You can set a fairly lightweight counterbalance like this stone here while you're setting up the trap. Once the trap is set, you can increase the amount of weight, therefore the amount of lifting power, by adding more stones to the piece that's already set there. In other words, I can attach more stones to this and increase the lifting energy a lot without having to mess with the trigger at all. A downside of this, you have to be very, very careful when you're setting this type of trap. It's actually happened to me. I bent over, worked on the trigger, and all of a sudden the thing will trigger and the rock falls on my head. Incredibly uncomfortable, but I have a good thick head. The spring pole and the counterweight are my two favorite engines. Now a couple of tips about the spring pole. First of all, when you're getting one of these things, it's best to try to find some piece of wood that's springy, but also fairly dead. If it's real green, once you set it and leave it for a while, it's going to take a set and stay bent. Now that means you're going to lose a lot of your lifting power. Now how do you attach this to the tree? Let me show you that trick. What I've done here in order to tie this to the tree trunk is I've passed a cord behind the tree. This is just a single line. Now you can see I've got a small loop off over here and another one off to the other side. Let me show you how this all goes together to make this thing a tight bind against the tree trunk. I just pass the loose end of the cord through the loop and then you see the other loop over here? Get that in there for you. <clears throat> La -da 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 -da. If my fingers get any fatter, I won't be able to carry them. There we go. Now you can see what I've done here. The cord comes through the loop off on the side and then back through the loop that's actually tied partially down the length of the cord. Now what you do is you just pull. When you pull, this kind of multiplies the effort that you're putting into it. So now this is nice and tight. In order to tie it off, all you need to do is squeeze it like so pass the cord behind and go like that. That leaves you with like a little loop and that's plenty strong enough to hold this in place. When you're ready to leave and take your setup with you, just jerk like that, everything releases and you can walk away with your cord, your spring pole and everything else with no damage to the tree. The wishbone type trigger system is an old classic, it's a real standby. The problem is, it has a lot of problems. Let me show you one of them. It starts out with a forked stick, something like this. Now, according to the books and all the other directions, you're supposed to shove this down into the earth <clears throat> and then attach your, your trigger, your engine, to the fork. Unfortunately, when you do that, a lot of times it tends to pull this up out of the ground. Secondarily, um, this ground that we happen to be on here, well, you just can't push this into the earth. So what I have here is a modification of that to show you how we can still use the wishbone type trigger without having to shove it in the ground. As you can see, I'm just using a rock to anchor it, tied the cords off to it, and now I've still got the major piece. There's another problem with this. Let me show you what that is. With the wishbone type trap, ordinarily what you're doing is you'll have a little trigger like this cord here. You can see it there and it'll sit behind the wishbone. 
the idea is, whoops, well, you can see right there. <laughs> idea is there'd be another trigger, something like this, sitting off to the side. When that's disturbed, this will fly free and it'll jump up in the air. But you can see it's not going anywhere. That means that it's not a very effective trap. Well, I have a technique, a modification for this that's going to turn this wishbone into a really effective trap. Let me show you how that's done. Ordinarily, the slip stick is just a piece of wood looking something like this. And the purpose of it is to allow the cord to slide through the fork in the branches. Well, my modification starts out with this. You carve a little bevel on the edge, as you see here, sharp from both edges. That's just the beginning. Let me show you the rest of it. What's different about this is I've made a third piece for the trigger, and it looks something like this. You can see it's about the same length as the little slip chunk here. It's got a notch on the top and one on the bottom. Let me show you how this goes together. I have the actual trigger, which is right here, and there are two faces on it. I've carved a little flat spot here and one here. Now I take my, my extra trigger, my I guess you can call it an escapement, and it, they fit together just like this. See how that is? like so, with one of the little notches facing up. Now what we do is this, and this is a little tricky. Let me get this in position. I always hate this spot. I've got to be ready to jump. There we go. I've got my little trigger and my extra piece. And it fits right in there like so. You can see how that all goes together now. Now what we do is ee! we take our little snare wire or snare loop, whatever we're using, and attach it to the end of the trigger. Something like this. I'm trying to be very careful here. <laughs> Help, get on there, you. Stay. There we go. That'll work. This is just for demonstrations, but you can see now we've got three pieces to the trigger. The cord, the engine, is already ready to take off, except for one little thing, and that's this piece here holding it all together. Now, one of the ideas behind twitch up snares is being able to use leverage in as many ways as possible. The less energy you require on your trigger in order to hold it together, the more easily it's going to be able to be tripped. The more energy you've got in your engine, the more powerful it's going to be and the larger the game that you're going to be able to capture. So how does this work? Well, the animal comes along, gets caught in this thing, triggers that, and it's gone. There's literally thousands of different types of triggers for twitch up snares. So I'm just going to show you two more. And these are both based on the same, well, the same two loops of cord. That's why I like it. It's really an easy trap to make. Both of them are an easy trap to make. Let me show you how they work. First one I want to show you is called, or used to be called, the nail trap. Let me show you how all of this puts together. You see, what I've got is an anchor here. And on that anchor I've got two little loops of cord tied. You can see it right there. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my my engine, which is right here. This is the engine pulling up. And I'm going to put my little trigger just like so. When you put it together, it'll seem obvious how, how it goes together. If I go like this, whoop, it slides off. And I almost killed myself and Karen. You can see how easily this comes apart now. What we want to do is put the second little loop just over the end of the stick. Now you can see if I was to, I'll put my thumb here for safety, just slide that off, that would release the trigger and she'd be on her way. So all we need to do is find some way to get this to come off of that stick in order to trigger it. Well, there are a lot of ways to do that. One way is to take another cord, and this is attached to a little anchor over here, just a piece of stone. 
Ordinarily, I wouldn't use a piece of string as a trigger because it has a tendency to stretch a little too much. Wire is better, or even a piece of wood just set in there. Now let me show you how we put this together. Just slide one loop over the other, like so. Eek. <sighs> wow, and that's it. Now all we have to do is put some pressure on that little cord there, and this thing's on its way. So, what do we do with the snare? Well, we can lay it over the top of the trigger and try to stay out of the way. By the way, be very careful. On this type of trap, the little trigger stick here flies away at a pretty high rate of speed, so keep your face and everything else you value away from it. Now, how does it work? Well, it works something like this. If our, if our happy duck or whatever it is comes over and goes, whoa, 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 I wonder what this is here, and pushes on that, then it's going to grab it. Whoa! The next trap I call the uh, hood lunch launcher. It starts out with the same two loops on our anchor and the same actual trigger that we saw in the previous trap, in the nail trap. So there it is there. It's all ready to go. Now, in order to make the hood lunch launcher or to set up the actual trigger for it, we just take a a trigger, you can see it here. I've got it, let me hold that. I've got a little notch carved in it right in here. That's all there is to it. Push that in through the upper loop like this and give it a twist like this. Straighten all these cords out. There we go. Da -da -da. Like that. And then bring her down to the trigger, like so. And that's the setup. Just that. Let me get out of the way here. These pieces go flying. Now, all that has to happen is something has to pull down on the end of the trigger, and when it does, this whole thing's going to take off. Now, I ought to tell you that, in any case, when you're using a twitch-up snare, you don't have to catch the animal by the neck. The snare loop can either be hanging from the end of the trigger, or it could be placed on the ground someplace, like down here so that when the animal is standing there, if he's nibbling on bait or if he's just touching it or whatever he's doing, he's in position to get caught. For instance, if the animal was standing here and he came up to this in this way here and started to nibble, Well, that's about it. I've showed you a few crushing style traps, a few twitch up snares. I've showed you the basic, well, the engines that make them all work, and snares, the holding type traps. Those are all important things, and it's not my intention to give you an exhaustive coverage of all of the different styles and all of the trapping techniques and so forth. We're just giving you kind of an overview. But the important thing is for you to find exactly what style of trap suits you. What do you want to work with? What do you want to see? Do you want it to be fancy with lots of moving parts or something simple like a good snare? That's up to you and it's up to the environment that you're in. Well, I guess that's about it for what we've got to show you on this one. Got one more thing to say to you. One more little thing. We want you to know that everything you saw in this video was for real. And we also want you to know that the marmots you saw trapped in this video are going to be on our dinner table tonight. Remember the rule. If you kill it, you've got to eat it. But there's another part of the rule that I didn't tell you. If you kill it, you've got to need it. Well, we hope you enjoyed this volume of the Woods Master and that you'll join us in the next one. Meanwhile, we hope you'll join us out here.